In my years of family practice, and then for seven years, I was medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, which is to say we looked after terminally ill people. <clears throat> I found that who got sick and who didn't was at all, not at all accidental. That, that there were certain patterns that I inevitably I had to be aware of. And all the people that got sick with chronic illness, whether that be, again, cancer, autoimmune disease, neurological disorders like ALS, MS, Parkinson's, and so on. What these patterns were, and I'm telling you, which may sound dogmatic, but I've been at the game long enough to be convinced of this, that there are no exceptions. I'm going to read you some newspaper clippings that illustrate who is illness-prone, and I'll, then I'll tell you why. The first is an article. These are all articles from the Global Mail newspaper, which is Canada's national paper, and I wrote a medical column for them for a couple of years. <clears throat> it's by a woman. The first article is by a woman who is diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna. Her doctor's name is Harold, and her husband is called Hi. And Hi, his first wife died of breast cancer, and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And Donna writes in his first-person account of her visit to the doctor's office. Harold tells me that the lump is small, and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hai, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice? She's the one diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness. We'll have to go through chemo, radiation, possibly surgery. And her first thought is, how will I support my husband emotionally? So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for disease. Major risk factor. The others that I will read you are actually obituaries from the same newspaper, and obituaries are fascinating because they tell us not just about the person who died, but also about what we value in one another unwittingly. And what we value in one another is exactly what kills us. You've heard the, ex you've heard the expression, the good die young. Half of you are breathing easily right now, and you're not worried. <laughs> so this obituary is uh, about a physician who died age 55 of cancer. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto's Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on, his, he carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So what would you say to a friend of yours diagnosed with cancer? Go back to work tomorrow, and all the while that you're getting treatment, ignore that, ignore your needs, don't think at all about your life, and just keep working until you drop. So this automatic and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the needs of the self, is the second major risk factor for chronic illness. The next one is written by a husband who is writing this with gratitude about his wife, who died age 55 of breast cancer. In her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst you could say was fui or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. And I'm sure that, like me, many of you have partners, spouses, sometimes you wish that they would blend in with the environment. <laughs> in an unassuming manner. But they won't do that if they want to stay healthy. Because the suppression of the so-called negative emotions, particularly anger, actually suppresses the immune system. And finally, this obituary, which is almost beyond belief, but it's real. This is a physician who died age 72 of cancer. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife, Roslyn, and their four young kids waited for him at home. Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy, until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. 
This man suffered from two fatal beliefs. One is that he's responsible for how the people feel. And secondly, that he must never disappoint anybody. So there's four, these four factors, this automatic concern for the emotional needs of others, ignoring your own, compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the authentic self, um, suppression of so-called negative emotions, repression of them, and finally, the belief that you're responsible for what other people feel and that you must never, never disappoint anybody, so you never say no. These are the significant risk factors that are present in cases of chronic illness, and they're quite capable of killing you, for reasons I'll explain shortly. But before I do, let's explain why people behave in these ways. Are we blaming the patient for the disease? We're not blaming the patient for the disease because these are not deliberate, consciously chosen patterns. Remember that Harvard article I quoted to you? Adaptations that help you survive the immediate uh, stress in childhood become source of pathology later on. These are all adaptations. Nobody chooses to believe, behave in these ways. And I can give you a personal example. So I, I'm, when I was 54 or so, I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on one of my knees. I had a bit of a tear in a cartilage. So that afternoon, I had a bit of a limp. And I'm visiting my mother, who there's a genetic disease in our family called muscular dystrophy, which means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. But by the way, most diseases are not like that, and there are very few diseases genetically determined. Uh, even in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is a breast cancer gene, or, or several breast cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. The gene is not the major cause of breast cancer. Muscular dystrophy, yes, if you have the gene, it's rare, but you're likely to have the disease. So my mother had it, so at age 78, she could no longer get out of bed, she could barely feed herself. Mentally, she was very strong. So I'm visiting her, and I'm, as I'm walking down the hall of the nursing um, home, I have a bit of a limp because of my surgery that morning. When I walk into my mother's room, my limp disappears. I greet her with a perfectly normal gait, and I walk out the same way until I shut the door behind me, and again I start limping. Now, what am I doing? I'm protecting her from no knowledge of my pain, but here's the deal. My mother, being 78, has survived the Nazi genocide in Hungary, the communist dictatorship, the Hungarian Revolution in 56, emigration to Canada at the age of 39 with a husband nearly 10 years older and um, two adolescent boys, life in a new culture and a new language. She was a very strong person. Did she need to be protected from the fact that her middle-aged son had a bit of a limp? <laughs> the afternoon of surgery. However, Remember that quote from Amos, that the child feels the suffering of the, uh, and, and pain of the mother. So I was born in January 44 in Budapest um, to Jewish parents. When I was two, two months old, the Germans occupied Hungary. And you can imagine what the rest of our year was like. And I learned very early that my mother was so stressed that if I wanted to maintain the attachment relationship with her, I better suppress my own pain because she was already overburdened. So that was an adaptation. And that adaptation still shows up in my automatic suppression of my limp 53 years later. This is what Robin Williams, who died at his own hands after a life of addiction, mental illness, and um, workaholism, called the please love me syndrome. Anything, I'll do anything but love me. See, the child has no choice. The child is in a situation where attachment, and attachment in this case is not in a Buddhist sense, but this is a modern psychological sense, attachment is the drive for closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of, or of taking care of someone else. So there's this powerful attachment drive between all mammals and their children, and their offspring, even birds and their offspring. That attachment drive keeps the infant close to the parent, the parent close to the infant, so the infant can be taken care of. And that attachment drive is um, important to us all our lives, as that example of those elderly couples indicates. In other words, that's the most important dynamic in human life, and our brains are largely wired for attachment, without which we don't survive, because the human infant is the least mature, most dependent, and most helpless of any creature in the universe and stays that way for the longest period of time. So without attachment, there's no life. This attachment drive, as I'll be telling you later in my talk on addiction this afternoon, is the source of... Um, when the attachment needs are not met, this is the source of all pathology, whether physical or mental. 
And how does it become a source of physical pathology? Well, because we have another need. We have the need for attachment, you, that's clear. But we have another need, and that is need for authenticity. Authenticity is a sense of being ourselves, and knowing who we are, and what we feel. No, that's not a, a new age, abstract, psychological, spiritual, uh, woohoo need. It's actually a survival need. Because to be authentic is to be in touch with your body and your gut feelings. And in the long period of evolutionary development, living in a state of nature amidst all kinds of nature, uh, dangers, how long exactly would a human being survive if they were not in touch with their gut feelings? They wouldn't. So that the, 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 the authenticity is as, as, as powerful as the attachment need in the long term. But what happens to a child where the authenticity threatens attachment? And what do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, as a one and a half year old, two year old, um, your child is angry at you. And by the way, if you have a one and a half and two year old and they're never angry with you, you're not doing your job. Because they can't have five cookies before dinner. And they can't climb on the table to play with a shiny knife. So they're gonna get frustrated. So they're gonna throw a tantrum, which is what they do. But how if, what about if you grow up in a home where there was a rageaholic father and the very hint of anger threatens you unconsciously? So you give the message to the child that good little kids don't get angry. In other words, good little, little kids who get angry are not good, they're not acceptable to the parent. Well, guess what? If that message is driven home powerfully enough, the child would repress the anger in order to maintain the attachment relationship. Pure adaptation. But in the long term, that repression of the authentic self, as in the cases I mentioned, is what leads to disease. So this is the please love me syndrome. Love me at any cost. The child, when it comes to attachment versus authenticity, has absolutely no choice in the matter. Because without attachment, they can't survive. Treat me like a fool, treat me mean and cool, but love me. That's not love. Just let me stay attached to you at any cost. Now the problem is that once you make the choice, although it's no choice at all, to go for attachment, then we spend the rest of our lives living that out. And we spend the rest of our lives suppressing our authenticity. Now, how does that lead to illness? Well, it leads to illness for the very simple reason that you can't separate the mind from the body. And we now know scientifically that there's no basis for those separations. So it's not that there's a nervous system and an immune system and a hormonal apparatus and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system. It's all part and parcel of the same system. So there's a science that's, I would say is new, but it's only relatively new. It's been around for a few decades now. It's called psychoneuro psychoneuroimmunology that studies the connections and the unity of the emotional system, the immune system, the hormonal apparatus, and the nervous system. It turns out there aren't separate systems, it's just one. To say that they're even connected is, is kind of false, because you connect two things that are discrete, but these are not discrete systems. 